Well, hello, dear friends. Welcome to our program, I'd Like to Know. This is a question and answer program where you can send your questions to us. We'll do the research, and if there is an answer, we'll try to find an answer to your question. If it's a mystery, well, we'll leave it in God's hands. Uh, if you want to send us a question, I want to give you the email address where you can send us the question. It'll be on the, on the uh, picture, uh, tv at sumtv.org. Once again, tv at sumtv.org. It should be on your screen right now. And uh, we'd be glad to receive your questions and uh, do the best to answer these questions. I have with me Daniel Miranda, who is associate speaker here at Secrets Unsealed. Uh, newly arrived, relatively speaking. Uh, we're glad that you're here with us, and we appreciate uh, the wisdom that God has given you to help answer the questions at the program. Amen. It is my privilege to participate in this program, one of my favorites, both in English and in Spanish. Amen. I feel the same. Yes. Uh, would you have prayer for us before we begin to answer the questions? Absolutely. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, once again we come before your presence. We understand that in us there is nothing good, there is no wisdom, there is no righteousness, there is no justice. But we can claim it from you, Lord. You have promised us it, that if we lack wisdom, we can ask for it from you, and you will give it to us abundantly. So we need that wisdom to be able to answer these questions. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay, we have a bunch of questions. Maybe I can just show you what we have. Oh, yeah. This plus some. And uh, we continually receive questions, uh, dozens of them every week. And so be patient. If you don't get an answer right away on the next program, realize that there are other questions and we answer them in the order in which they come. So the question that we have here, I want to address this to uh, Daniel. What is your opinion on the three most debated textual criticism verses. For example, the Johannine comma, the story of the adulterous woman, and the long and short ending of the Gospel of Mark. Who is right and who is wrong about them? Are they late inserts, etc.? Can we use Ellen White as a textual critic? Clarification. She had, after 1885, available the King James Version and the English Revised Version, later known as the ASV. So can her choice of particular translation show us whether the received text is the correct one or the version of Westcott and Hort? A little example about Revelation 22:14. She quotes, all times the King James Version, do His commandments. And once in Maranatha, Blessed are they that wash their robes. In interpreting scripture, the Biblical Research Institute studies volume two. Ranko Stefanovic says that evidence strongly suggests that wash their robe, robes is the authentic one. Who is right, Ellen White or Stefanovic? Uh, it's a, several questions right. in one. Uh, what can we say about uh, those three passages that are mentioned at the beginning of this question? Yeah, the first part of the question deals with uh, textual criticism. <clears throat> there is a, uh, some controversy in regards to this particular text. For example, the Johannine comma, which is actually 1 John 5, 7. And I think the New King James includes it. Let's read it. 1 John uh, 5, 7. Or let's see. Yes, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are as one. So the, the discussion here is that that part from verse 7 where it says, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one, and the first half of verse 8 and there are three that bear witness on earth. Um, some suggest that that was not in the original. Mm -hmm. I mean, actually, you should read it, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. Uh, m modern translations, that's the way they have them. Now, we don't need this text to prove the Godhead. 
Because right. there is a, abundant evidence in other parts of the scriptures Amen. About, about the Godhead. But from my research, uh, I don't have a complete knowledge on this. I haven't gone in depth with this topic about textual criticism. But from the textus receptus, we know that these portions are included. But in the Vaticano Sinaiticus, Sinaiticus uh, it is not. Um, so it is hard to determine uh, sometimes. But um, some of these, for example, John 8, the story of the adulterer woman, Ellen White quotes it. And she right. even has it in the Desire of Ages. Right. So uh, there is some truth in it. And she also quotes extensively verses from the long ending of Mark. Right. Because there's a shorter ending. I think it ends at verse 9 mm -hmm. in the modern version. In fact, that would be the shorter ending, yeah. Yeah. There, there are two, um, two different types of manuscripts that were used for translation. One is the, the text that was uh, established by Erasmus the Textus Receptus. Mm -hmm. The other is uh, Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, etc. And uh, in the Old Testament, there's no real issue. There's not huge issues about uh, translations because you don't have the same, uh, same manuscript problem that you have in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the King James and the New King James, to a certain extent, uh, use the Textus Receptus. The more modern versions use... Uh, the, the Western text type. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the decision needs to be made as to whether uh, you're going to accept one group of manuscripts or the other group of manuscripts. Um, the fact that Ellen White makes a point of the story of the adulterous woman, she doesn't only mention it in passing, but she actually has a lot to say about it. Yeah. And the fact that she uses the last uh, portion of Mark, the longer portion of Mark, in many places in her writings would seem to indicate that those belong in Scripture. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't checked to see whether the, the Johannine passage uh, is commented on by Ellen White, but as you mentioned, it doesn't really make any difference whether, whether that was there or wasn't there because we have other verses like Matthew 28 right. where it says, Name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Uh, also 2 Corinthians 13 verse 14, the last verse of 2 Corinthians. You know, we have three present at the baptism of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, and Ellen White recognized that there might be mistranslations and there might be manuscript issues mm -hmm. in Selected Messages, Volume 1. She says, but that shouldn't shake your faith because other verses of the Bible will clarify what perhaps isn't clear in that particular passage or verse. Yeah, I think, and that would be the best approach we, shall, we can take when it comes to these uh, apparent contradictions or these apparent errors that we might find in some of the translations. Mm -hmm. I mean, God's hand has not only been in the inspiration of the Bible, but also in protecting and preserving the truths of mm -hmm. the Bible. Right. So there might be some things that are not as significant, and yet that they don't alter the message of the Word of God. Right. The, 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 main, thing the main thing is the focus of the message of Scripture, yes. the central message of the Scripture. And if anything deviates from that, well, for example, if, uh, if the modern versions had uh, a verse that says, you know, that we should consult the spirit world, <laughs> you would immediately know that that does not belong to the biblical text because of everything that the Bible says. Correct. But most of these variations are really small variations. They're insignificant variations in the translation, with, with some exceptions, of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it mention is made particularly of Revelation 22, verse 14. Uh, maybe we should uh, kind of delve into that a little bit, Revelation 22, verse 14. Um, you know, sometimes uh, a copyist undoubtedly was careless in the way in which he uh, was uh, transcribing mm -hmm. uh, the words of Scripture. Um, wash their robes uh, is tas stolas. Whereas keep the commandments is tas entolas, which is very similar. And so it'd be very easy if you're being hasty in copying that you might have, uh, you know, uh, copied the wrong word. Mm. Um, however, in this case, uh, I think it's just arguing over nothing mm. because the book of Revelation uses wash their robes and uses keep the commandments elsewhere in the book. Right. 
So, so, you know, whether it's wash your robes or keep the commandments, in this specific verse, I think keep the commandments is the best translation, by the way. Mm -hmm. But there's other verses that speak about keeping the commandments. Right. Uh, for example, Revelation 12, 17, they keep the commandments of God. And then in Revelation chapter 7, they have washed their robes mm -hmm. and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So both are true. Mm -hmm. uh, but you don't have to depend on Revelation 22 verse 14 to say that you're going to have a group that do the commandments because the other verses make it absolutely clear. Amen. Very good. Also, uh, li a little note here in regards to Ellen White's inspiration. Um, you know, he asked at the end, who is right, Ellen White or Stefanovic? Uh, we need to understand that in Ellen White's time, those are the versions that she had available. Yes. And inspiration picks the best resources at hand in the time of the prophet right. to make a point. Right. I mean, today we have even more resources. And if she were alive, she would use more of the versions that we, had to, yeah. we have today to make certain points. But... Um, the Bible itself is clear, and Ellen White, well, Ellen White of course, she supports uh, and seconds what the Bible says, but, um, but sometimes we cannot, we, we have to be careful in regards to her use of other sources and versions when we try to m build a case right. on the way she uses other um, sources. Yeah, you know, um, Ellen White used the authorized version um, Occasionally, mm -hmm. very occasionally, um, you know the, the the more modern version, as it as it says here, the um, uh, how what is the expression? The, the ASV. The ASV. Yeah. Uh, English revised. The the English revised version. Um, she used that version very sparingly, mm -hmm. once in a while, and sometimes you know she translated w with. Uh, one way and the other way. To give you an example, John 5, 39, it says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And then the King James says, search the scriptures. Mm -hmm. So one is in the imperative and the other is indicative. Now the Greek won't tell you which is the correct translation because it's identical. The imperative and the nominative are identical mm. in Greek. So you have to take into, the, into account the context Ellen White sometimes quotes, you search the scriptures for you think you have eternal life. And in another place she quotes, uh, search the scriptures as an imperative. Both are true. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, one or the other is not going to change the tenor or the meaning of scripture or even of that particular verse. Right. Very good. Okay, so um, I hope that that has been helpful. Uh, you know, we are not expert textual critics. Uh, <laughs> I have studied quite a bit about textual criticism, but uh, that's not my particular field. But um, what's the next question that we have? Yes, the next question comes from Robert Enakijev. And the question is, actually he has two questions. The first one is, do you believe that God in this day still allows hardships to fall on his followers in order to awaken them back into the gospel? That's the first question. Uh, that's an easy question. Um, right. Actually, this quarter we have a lesson, our quarterly, in the crucible with Christ. Yep. And there clearly we see that uh, God may allow sometimes trials and tribulations to come upon us mm -hmm. to bring us back again into the faith. So this is one of the means that God uses to awaken us. Yes. And this happens in several ways and in different circumstances. God has a lesson to teach us. He, has, he wants us to learn a song as we studied last week. Yeah. As the bird in the cage, he wants us to learn a song in the darkness of tribulation. As Amen. Ellen Weiss is in the Amen. ministry of healing. That's right. So I think that that question is actually quite simple to answer. Yeah. God still allows his people to go through trials because trials are meant to make us, not to break us. In other words, the trial is to make us stronger in our relationship with the Lord, more dependent upon Him. Actually, and actually, even the 144,000, Ellen White says in the great controversy mm -hmm. that during the time of trouble, uh, the, 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 this time of trouble will uh, eradicate all the worldliness 
and mm -hmm. the dress in their characters. Uh, she uses actually the word worldliness. So even mm -hmm. they will be still even purified mm -hmm. after even being sealed through trials, even yeah. in their sealed condition. Yeah, actually the word she uses is that he will consume their earthliness. Earthliness, uh, thank you. Because yeah. worldliness, worldliness would is, mean is, that is they're different. still worldly yeah, exactly. focus, but <laughs> earthliness means uh, God during the time of trouble wants to consume everything that links them with this world, mm -hmm. like Enoch. Right. You know, Enoch reached the point where God said, there's no use staying there. You know, you, your, your heart is up here, your mind is up here, so come on up here, we'll walk down the street of gold. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the condition that God wants them to reach, but even in eternity, once we receive our immortal and incorruptible bodies, we're still going to grow. Amen. We're never going to stop growing in our relationship with the Lord, it becomes stronger and stronger the longer we live, even in eternity future. Amen. Okay, the second question from the same brother, has the great shaking begun? Well, um, Ellen White emphasizes that there are three main things that are going to shake people out of the message. Mm -hmm. Number one is worldliness, the attractions of the world. You know, the more concerned about what you have, you know, your degrees and your money and your houses and your cars, uh, worldly things. That's going to take many people out. The second thing is false teachings. Right. Is going to also lead people to leave the church. But the final uh, thing that is going to lead to the great shaking is persecution. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in a previous session, we talked about Matthew chapter 24. We did. And so maybe we can go back there to Matthew chapter 24. And while we go to Matthew 24, there's actually one more reason that was going to cause the shaking. And she says the, the testimony of the faithful witness yeah. to the Laodicea. And that's, that's related to uh, the one that we're looking at now. Okay. That's very closely related to that. Um, people who are word lukewarm, will be shaken out when persecution comes. Right. Uh, so Matthew chapter 24 and verse 6 says, You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. Mark adds that there's going to be tumults, which is riots. Mm -hmm. uh, wars are external wars. Riots are internal turmoil in society. And then it says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. And then notice, as a result of these disasters, it says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then the very next verse is, is key, because it says, and then, hmm. in other words, when the persecution comes, then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Uh, that's talking about the shaking. Yeah. That word offended is the same word that is used in the parable of the sower for those who were sowed in stony ground. Mm -hmm. uh, the seed fell, it started to sprout, but when the sun came out, it burned the small plant. And when Jesus made the application, he said that they have no depth of spiritual experience. Mm. They start their growth because they're excited. You know, they suddenly knew the truth. They're excited about it. They're pumped up. But there's not that internal profound work of the Holy Spirit upon the heart. And therefore, when Jesus interprets the sun burning the plant as tribulations and difficulties, when they come, they fall away, mm. which is basically the shaking. So the great shaking is going to take place when uh, the lukewarm will be shaken out. Yes. They will be vomited out of God's mouth. Right. Okay, um, I guess there were only two questions on this one. There were only two questions. Uh, so let's go to our next question. What's the next question? The next question comes from Jay Richter. Richter. Uh, Dear sir, I enjoy your program very much. If you already have a program on this subject, please let me know and provide a, a, a link, I guess. How is this done? And the question and the title has to do with the true use of the, of the wheel. How is this done? Do I grit my teeth and grit, grunt? Do I ask the Holy Spirit, Jesus or the Father, to give me willpower? When I looked on YouTube, 
those seem to be spiritualist. Please help. There needs to be a YouTube on this. Okay, so the question has to do with the, with the proper w use of the will. Mm -hmm. And Ellen White states that the will is the key to everything. It's yes. the key to failure or it's the key, key to success in the Christian life. Uh, so um, is the use of the will something that we do? You know, I'm, I'm going to have the willpower. You know, I'm a strong coffee drinker and I'm going to use my power to quit. There are people who do that, by the way. There are people who are not religious mm -hmm. that quit cold turkey, so to speak. <laughs> But uh, is that what uh, the proper use of the will is for a Christian? That's the big question. Well, Ellen White says in the, in the book uh, Steps to Christ that an unconverted heart can make external changes. Mm -hmm. uh, what some of the motivations w will be or can be the love of reputation, uh, selfish interest to uh, uh, attract the attention to himself. But the uh, true... Conversion comes from the heart, mm -hmm. from a, a renewed heart that has been given to the will of God. Right. Yeah. And, and the aid of the Holy Spirit. And with the aid of the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Right. So in other words, um, there are individuals who can overcome bad habits by an exercise of the power of the will. But in order to have a true victory over a sinful practice you need to have uh, the help of the Holy Spirit. You need to invite the Holy Spirit into your life to strengthen your will and to give you the determination to make the change, not because you have to, but because you want Jesus to dwell in your heart. Yeah, now I have a, I want to read a text. This is found in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to read verse 13. And this text um, talks about cooperation between mm -hmm. us and God. It says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Mm -hmm. Now notice, he, he doesn't do it for us. I mean, he right. doesn't make the decision for us, but he works in us to will. In other words, he puts the desire, mm -hmm. he invites. And then when we accept that, then he also does for us for his good pleasure. I have a quote from, actually I have several quotes from Ellen White. I would recommend my dear brother to read chapter 76 of Mind, Character, and Personality, volume two. There is a whole chapter on the decision and the will, how to use the willpower. It says here in page six, 685, the will is the governing power in the nature of man. Mm -hmm bringing all the other faculties under its sway. The will is not the taste or the inclination, but it is the deciding power which works in the children of men unto obedience to God or unto disobedience. So it is the power of God that God has given to man. Yep. Now, this power has been weakened or perverted by sin because we gave our will to Satan, right. but we can still choose. Uh, Ellen White says that we are not uh, doomed to keep sinning because now Satan has our willpower, but we can still choose to serve God. Right. We see examples in the Bible, in the Gospels, for example, the demon possessed, that even their weakest efforts to reach out to Christ, he saw that and he answered to their weakest efforts. For example, the, the, the person that was trying to talk to Jesus, but then the demon spoke instead of him. Mm -hmm. But Jesus recognized in the depth of his heart that this man right. wanted deliverance. Right. And Jesus uh, supplemented his weakness, his willpower, and he enters and helps him uh, be delivered from the demons. There is another quote here that we find in, in the same chapter. It says, um, all right here. Everything depends on its right action. The tempted one needs to understand the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision of choice. Everything depends on the right action of the will. Desires for goodness and purity are right as far as they go. But if we stop here, they avail nothing. Many will go down to ruin 
while hoping and desiring to overcome their evil propensities. They do not yield uh, to they do not, they do not yield their will to God. They do not choose to serve Him. Yep. So we're the ones that make the decision. Yeah, and you know the passage that you quoted in Philippians two uh, has that combination. Mm -hmm. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Sounds almost like we have to work our salvation. Right. But then the next verse gives the balance. For it is God who works in you. Amen. Both to will and to do for His good pleasure. Amen. So God gives us uh, the power of the will, to exercise the power of the will, and to do His good pleasure. And of course, another verse which is known by everyone, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. So it's not just gritting your teeth and saying, I'm going to overcome this whether it kills me. No, <laughs> it's a case of saying, Jesus, take my will, show me what your will is, and then give me the strength through the power of your spirit Amen. to overcome. That's the secret. But, but God won't do for us what we can do for ourselves. Exactly. He's given us the will. So He's not going to will for us. Exactly. He's given us the will and He's willing to guide the will through the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and then the, maybe there is not much time to talk about this, but the Armenian Wesleyan concept of the will, the prevenient grace, uh, which is built on the case of original sin, they teach that um, since we are born sinners, mm -hmm. the will is so perverted that we, cannot, we can never choose for ourselves yeah. and that we need grace, the, the so-called prevenient grace. But even though the will has been weakened still, we can choose, the, God has given us that right. willpower and it is for us to exercise that willpower. Yep, He's given us the power of choice. Yeah. Never removes the power of choice. Exactly. Well, folks, unfortunately, time flies when we're having a good time. I <laughs> hope that the answers to these questions have been satisfactory. Um, you know, the Bible has the answers to the questions many times that we have. It doesn't answer many mysteries. We have to just say, thank you, Lord. We'll, keep, we'll allow you to keep this in your own mind. I hope that you'll join us next time. May God bless you and keep you in His care. Amen.